Well, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, nice to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, Prajesh, for the kind invitation uh, to this Alva uh, live webinar on complex uh, shoulder injuries. Uh, thank you, uh, Ashoka, for the kind introduction. And thank you, uh, Dr. Raji Bandari, Chairman, uh, and also our co-panelist, Dr. Abai, uh, Dr. Banerjee, Dr. Abhijit Mukherjee. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, let me just start my presentation. Uh, it's up time to talk about uh, scapular fracture because we are only dealing with the fracture scenario uh, in this uh, COVID times. Uh, okay. So shoulder joint is uh, complex. It's got a glenohumeral joint, acromioclavicular joint, sternoclavicular joint, subacromial bursa, scapular thoracic joint. It's a combination of uh, uh, four or five joints. Uh, and the scapula is a mobile platform. The, uh, there is a core muscle, then the scapula, then the glenohumeral joint comes, and it is stabilized by uh, muscles. So it's an important bone. It assists in the movement of the shoulder joint. It acts like a mobile platform, as I already said, for the humeral head and the entire upper lip. as a point of attachment of muscles, tendons, ligaments. Uh, as such a scapular fracture, the prevalence is low, is 1%, it's a high energy trauma, Often there are a lot of associated injuries. The incidence varies from 60 to 98, and the mortality is two to 15% is dependent on the associated injuries. It is never an isolated fracture, or mostly it is not an isolated fracture. And the important thing is 90%, 90% of them are minimally displaced, hence conservative treatment. So the treatment option is very simple. Either you conservative or you do operate. So when do you want to operate? How to operate? That's going to be my uh, focus for the next 15, 20 minutes. It's usually a forgotten bone in polytrauma setting because multiple associated injuries take priority and it's easy to conservatively treat a uh, scapular fracture, put in a sling and uh, you know, a strong belief that it will always heal. Well, most of the scapular fracture heal, but if some fracture heal like this with the medial displacement with the deformity, the patient might not be happy and it's very difficult to correct these things when they present late. So why there is no consensus in the scapular fracture management? I already told it's 1% of all fracture. It is rare. And there is no standardized method of measuring or classification of a fracture. And there are different outcome measures and there is the influence by the associated injuries and there are only case series and there are uh, expert opinion. So, uh, in my practice, uh, I uh, work in a, a quaternary referral type of institute, so I tend to see most of these complex fractures. I do not see any simple fracture of the scapula, by the way. And I'm going to show you seven cases uh, from uh, pre-op to final follow-up to show how we dealt with. Very important to highlight the clinical examination. The entire uh, shoulder uh, girdle is swollen sometimes, but arm is kept in adequate position that you can't do much examination, but local swelling, echemosis, crepitus points to fracture scapula. Uh, and the most important thing is you have to document neurovascular status because commonly it is missed. At least you have to do a sensory examination and document because once you treat the patient, uh, conservative or operative, then things turn out to be ugly. The standard x-rays I do is these four x-rays, a shoulder AP, a shoulder lateral, then the scapular AP and the scapular lateral. Let us see the difference. There is the shoulder AP, and that is a scapular AP on the right side. You see the profile of the uh, scapula, neck, and ACJ in a clear uh, manner. Same way, you do the axial lateral view of the shoulder to check the glenohumeral alignment, subluxation, dislocation. Same way, you do the Y view of the scapula that shows the eight, uh, uh, two processes and the scapular blade like a Mercedes Benz sign view and the femoral head should be centered. This is the key X-ray for this scapula. But if in doubt, if you have displacement or if you suspect articular fracture, uh, get a 3D CT scan. Uh, and the 3D CT scan also, it is important to subtract the humerus and see the glenoid. A couple of measurements have been described in the uh, uh, CT scan. One is called glenopolar angle, which is the angle uh, subtended by the glenoid plane to the lateral border of scapula. And also second is the medial lateral displacement by a millimeter. This, both these angles are compared to the opposite side, but this is mostly for uh, uh, comparing results and uh, publication view. Fracture based on location, it could be body and spine, the glenoid neck, glenoid fossa, Acromion and coracoid, this is actually the percentage of fracture geometric location. Let us go through the cases. 
a 44 year old man bike hit against a lorry he sustained a dislocation of the shoulder if you see this a reduced uh, 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 x ray you could see a small uh, irregularity in the anterior uh, glenoid margin so this is the marginal anterior bony bancot type of lesion so this is actually uh, you could see that here in the ct scan so this is coming under glenoid fossa fracture iceberg classification type 1a 1b is posterior 1a is anterior marginal fracture so here i elected to treat this because it's associated with the instability with the bony bank or the highest chance is to get it uh, healed uh, uh, operatively because it is uh, displaced and is contributing to stability so if you look at that there is a scope view from the posterior and that is the scope view from antero superior you would see the femoral head on the top glenoid and the probe is now probing the IGHL, uh, MGHL ligament with the attached glenoid fragment. There are multiple ways of fixing this fragment. If this fragment is big enough, you could go for percutaneous or cannulated screws, but in this case, it is very thin fragment, so I decided to do arthroscopic fixation. Arthroscopic fixation could be done in two ways, either a, a, a double row footprint repair or do a suture actor repair. Because the ring is intact, I decided to do this with a suture anchor repair. As you see, uh, the uh, you know, bites are taken below and above the glenoid chip fragment. And here it is uh, fixed with the knotless anchor system because that gives good compression. So that is how it's done. Uh, so this is the next view. You see that the inferior anchor has been uh, deployed and the superior anchor is deployed after taking two matter sutures of the superior uh, labral ring if the labral ring is broken we had to repair that separately so at the at the end it looks like this so the glenoid you have the repair of the uh, fragment and that's the uh, long head of biceps and that's the centered femoral head in addition the patient had a superior labral tear which i have repaired as well as well as i did a remplissage to have a protective effect on the uh, repair of the anterior aspect. So that is him at uh, two months post arthroscopic repair, a well stabilized shoulder. You could see the glenoid bony bank dot has healed well on the x ray with a uh, uh, reasonably good range of recovery of movement, including a uh, very good external of the patient. So, Moving to the case, next case, 34 year old gentleman with a road traffic accident, he had a fracture dislocation. I could see that, you could see some irregularity on the inferior glenoid margin, but that's not the only injury. A CT scan shows that there is a, a big chunk of a glenoid fracture also associated with the greater tuberosity fracture dislocation. So according to this glenoid uh, fossa fracture classification, Eidberg, this is type two. You have a glenoid fracture with the uh, extending into the inferior uh, pillar. So what is, uh, uh, what is Eidberg's observation? He said no pointing in closed reduction of these fractures. Usually if you, when you decide to treat a fracture in the uh, glenoid fossa, what we are expecting is molding by the muscle forces and get going. Uh, so you, you, he said good results in more than 75% with early mobilization, but you had to consider surgery if the displacement is significant to reduce arthritis, to prevent instability of the joint. In this particular patient, there is a risk is both instability as well as a risk of arthritis because of displacement. So here, uh, I decided to do this with an open approach because the, uh, the glenoid fragment is big chunk. It is not small. It could take up screw. Uh, it could, there is a possibility of doing this uh, arthroscopic as well, but because of the associated GT fracture, it makes uh, a bit more difficult. So I just decided to do an anterior Deltopical approach and uh, fix this glenoid fragment as we do the lethargy uh, bone graft repair. And second is uh, the greater tuberosity. We had to fix that because we have opened that and it is displaced. So I did the speed bridge technique. This just a replication of our arthroscopic cup repair technique to put a couple of anchor medially and a couple of anchor laterally to fix the GT uh, uh, fracture. So this patient uh, has done well, and that is uh, showing the one scar, the delta pectoral approach scar, and good healing of the um, fra both fractures with good restoration of movement. This is uh, him at uh, two months follow-up. So moving to the third case in this glenoid fossa series, a 25-year-old man, three <coughs> weeks accident. He didn't come uh, initially. He had uh, multiple other injuries taking priority. As I said before, they decide the prognosis. So he's here after three weeks. And then so if you look at closely, this is uh, actually uh, 
uh, Eidberg type four, basically there is a split of the glenoid fossa and the fracture line extending straight across. There is also additional body fracture, but we can ignore that. So here, there is a significant intraarticular displacement of a fracture uh, in a young patient delayed presentation. So what do we do here? The, this is an indication to operate fix because of the articular displacement. But if it is acute setting, there is a possibility of a, a percutaneous or arthroscopic assisted, but here it is three weeks of head to resort to open approach. How to approach these uh, injuries? by posterior approach. We have three posterior approaches described. It's a classical Jude extensive approach, a deltoid split approach, and a subdeltoid approach. My preference is the subdeltoid approach. So you have to be aware of the nerve anatomy when you go uh, around the shoulder, as especially the uh, posterior aspect. The risk is axillary nerve, suprascapular nerve, radial nerve, but these are very well kept away if you stick to the principles. This is the classical Jude approach where you take off the deltoid, which is more uh, like a big open approach to expose the entire scapula, including the spine of scapula. Uh, in particular access where you want to access only the glenohumeral joint, you don't need that. We just do a sub deltoid approach that is a line of incision I make and then you retract the deltoid upwards and then you go between the interval between the infraspinatus and teres minor and you expose the capsule. So this is the line of action inside. So the patient is placed in lateral position with the serum coming from the top to have continuous screening images uh, and then that is the uh, glenoid water you've done through the infraspinatus teres minor approach. I had to put a couple of plates here because of the resistant uh, um, displacement. Uh, a couple of hand system plate. You could put, uh, there are pre contoured plate available in the West in England. For example, I was doing with Acumate system, but here I use the hand system plate, which around two to 2.4 millimeter screws. You cannot put uh, 3.5 or more than that because that is too big for the uh, scapula. So that is the closure of the interval and that's the uh, skin closure. We just put a drain as well because of the hematoma. Uh, six months follow up the same patient, uh, very well healed and good restoration of her function. You could see the scar on the right hand image. So that's about the glenoid fossa. Let's move on to the scapular body fracture. They usually heal well. These are all like impaction direct injuries on the uh, body. They rarely lead to symptomatic malunion and the fixation is considered only if there is grass displacement. For example, this is a 44 year old gentleman with a chest injury, knee fracture, and also has this. If you look at it, uh, he has a body fracture and uh, what we want to know is whether the glenoid is intact. So how, what, what the way I say, do that, subtract the humerus and look at the glenoid fossa, it looks intact. So there is no need to op operate on this patient at all. So this patient was put in sling, ice pack, mobilizers, comforter loads, and that's what you get four Probably weeks post-injury, just conservative treatment is able to independently elevate the arm. Let the patient uh, move because the expectation is the, uh, the scapular muscles like sandwich the scapular bone blade and then let it heal. But not all patients have the beauty. Uh, this patient came to me after a month, uh, one month after a rotafic accident with painful prominent uh, scapular bone. Because if you look at that, the broken scapular body fragment has rotated and tilted and is causing uh, him uh, a cosmetic as well as functional uh, problem. But he had a good range of movement of the glenohumeral joint, but it is a local discomfort he had. So in this very rare particular scenario, we resort to operative fixation. Again, you go through the direct pillar approach to the lateral border of scapula. You don't need to go through the extensive Jude approach. And that is how the fixation was done with a couple of plate. And he has, uh, the two fractures at two levels were plated and he has done well. So that's the closure. So that is him at a six months follow up, good rotation, good movement. Now, let us move on to the next uh, section is a superior shoulder suspensory complex. We, uh, this is an easy way to understand the uh, rest of the scapular fracture of the, the entire rest of the body. So you have three strut. The top strut is the clavicle ACJ acromion strut. The second strut is the coracoid, coracoclavicular ligament and clavicle strut. And the third is the upper half of the uh, glenoid with this associated coracoid and acromion processes. So these three are the uh, strut, 
where there is single disruption, it could be a dislocal fracture, AC joint dislocation, or coracoid process as acromion fracture, it's termed as stable. But if it is a double, triple, it is said to be unstable. But it is not always the case. Even single disruption can be unstable. There's a beautiful paper on this coracoid process acromion fracture here, if somebody wants to know further details. But basically, the coracoid fracture are classified into two types. Uh, the type one that is proximal to the coracoclavicular attachment that needs surgical attention or it, it is a symptomatic non-union. A type two fracture uh, occurring distal to the coracoclavicular ligament doesn't need to be addressed. It could be left alone. The coracoid fracture, when indicated, it is fixed with a screw fixation. Next is the acromion fracture. Isolated acromion uh, fracture or rare, usually it occurs in combination with the rest of the uh, scapular fracture or clavicle fracture. These are the types classification by Kuhn. And um, according to this, type 1 and 1B are undisplaced. Type 2 is displaced but normal subacromial distance. And type 3 is a reduced to subacromial space where there is uh, a deforming force by the deltoid and the muscles. And the fracture goes for more union, non-union. And second, there is also mechanical impingement of the rotator a cuff. So this type needs surgery. The mechanism of mechanics of uh, fixation is either a tension band wire or a plate as uh, the situation demands. We will see the example in the next few cases. So double disruption as the classical floating shoulder, uh, neck fracture with mid shaft clavicle fractures. Dr. John is going to address that, so I will leave it. Triple disruption had been described with the coracoid acromion uh, clavicle or coracoid acromion ACG, but uh, I tend to see a lot of uh, multiple disruption in the whole shoulder girdle. Let me show a couple of cases uh, which I have sh also shared in the international uh, forum. So this is the 43 year old policeman after road traffic accident, uh, severely swollen shoulder can't move. And this is the uh, uh, x-rays. So if you look at it, that is a CT scan. And uh, you can take a moment to look at what is broken here. A scapular body fracture, a coracoid process fracture, a chromium process fracture, as well as you see a chromium spine fracture and clenoid intraarticular fracture. But the order of priority to restore the strut, I decided to fix the acromion process because that is important. Acromion spine, yes, there are, it is a deformity and there is an intraarticular fracture. So here, we cannot address all these with a single approach. So we went through the posterior approach, fixed the acromion process fracture with the tension band wiring, and then did plating of the acromion spine. This is the pre-contoured uh, plate from the clavicle set, which I have applied for the spine of scapula. We could use like that also. So that's the fixation posterior. Wound is closed. Patient is uh, redraped, positioned in the sitting position. After this fixation, anterior approach is made and we fix the uh, glenoid fracture as like we do the lethargy approach with a subscap split incision. So this is him at the five year follow up because I, 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 he sent his uh, pictures. Uh, he was on a COVID duty and he's back to duty, back to driving his bike with uh, that range of movement and more importantly, uh, a good uh, rotation of the uh, glenohumeral joint. So the last case uh, is a 30 year old man, uh, right handed, he's a professional percussionist. Uh, he suffered a road traffic accident. He had a fracture, multiple ribs, chemothorax, fracture spinous process D3 to D9. Uh, this is the common pattern of this uh, polytrauma uh, case and the right shoulder injury he had. So that is, that is his Hello. If you if look at it, that is the, uh, you could see the intro fracture very displaced. And a lot of fracture so that is his uh, 3D CT. As you see, there is a scapular body fracture. The AC joint seems to be subluxed. A chromium spine fracture is there, which is type three. You see the angulation. Uh, this is the type three that caused mechanical impingement and mole union. And the glenoid Eidberg phi type A fracture. So I decided to fix the priority here is to restore the strength, restore the joint, restore the strength. That is my uh, uh, advice. So here we uh, did the glenoid plating from the posterior approach. Here we approached this through the same incision. So the uh, glenoid is plated with a four-fold plate and the glenoid uh, articular surface is reduced. Then when uh, the same incision on the top, we just fix the uh, acromion spine with a locking lateral clavicle plate. So with this, uh, uh, 
This is the first of X-ray starting at uh, three months post operative. As well as good external rotation, because if you restore the glenoid intraarticular fracture and mobilize the patient early, I normally put this patient in a sling for comfort, but mobilize them from a day uh, one postoperative, doing regular pendular movements, uh, forward assisted forward elevation, as well as uh, allowing uh, shoulder shrug, shoulder bracing, etc. Et because we need to mobilize the shoulder after fixing the important strip as well as the intraarticular component. So he just sent me this uh, uh, picture video of the six months follow-up. He's able to play back the instrument for long, uh, one to two hours without any problem. So to summarize, uh, the, uh, before summarizing, there are some complications reported with um, the scapular fracture. And if you look at it, there's most of them neurogenic, brachial plexus injury, but you have to really identify and document. I do, I do have a few cases of this suprascapular nerve uh, injury associated with scapular fracture, but you need to get the uh, uh, appropriate help to diagnose as well as to treat it. Of the conservative treatment, occasional scapular thoracic crepitus, but if there is a glenoid fracture mall union, it leads to stiffness, instability, or arthritis. Of operative treatment, the common thing we see is the metalwork discomfort. If the metalwork is causing discomfort, you could remove it. Otherwise, I do not routinely remove any of this metalwork unless it is a tension band wire. Infection nerve injury is also reported. To summarize, assess and treat the associated injuries that takes priority in deciding the timing as well as management of your scapular fracture. Respect the scapular fracture, don't ignore, uh, and try to get a 3D CT to understand the pattern of injury and the mostly conservative treatment, except when there is an articular fracture gap or a step or a displaced clavicle fracture, scapular neck fracture, John is going to talk about it, and also triple multiple disruption, restore the key strut. Thank you very much. Thank you.